Hi, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work in the Advanced Technology Centre in the UK, part of IBM Europe. This is the third of three movies looking at common misunderstandings about the power processor and how they work. In this one we're going to be looking at the shared and capped virtual CPU logical partitions. In the previous two movies, and I recommend you watch those first, we've looked at how many CPUs are on a Power 4, Power 5 or Power 6 chip, and the answer is two. Two physical CPUs per chip. The second movie looked at logical CPUs and do they exist and when we switch the SMT feature on we actually end up with two logical CPUs running on one physical CPU. But the logical CPUs don't actually exist. It's just a way of getting two programs to be scheduled to operate on one physical CPU. They actually run at the same time using the same processor and both complete instructions every clock cycle but the logical CPUs don't actually exist. In this movie we're going to be looking at micropartitions and in particular the shared processor logical partition. For contrast we'll look at dedicated and donating and then we'll look at these key features of shared CPU logical partitions that I get most questions about and confuses quite a few people. Before we look at shared CPU logical partitions in detail, let's remind ourselves of the differences between the dedicated CPU and the shared CPU logical partitions. We'll look at this one, a special case called donating at the end. For a dedicated CPU, the CPUs are allocated to the logical partition for their sole use. But in a shared CPU partition, the CPUs are actually given to the CPU pool and your logical partition is guaranteed CPU time from that pool. For dedicated CPUs, they're allocated in a whole CPU. For shared CPUs, they're allocated in hundreds of a CPU once you're above the tenth of a processor minimum for your logical partition. Dedicated CPU partitions are easy to understand because they just look like a standard SMP machine. You have, say, four CPUs, they are yours, you do what you like with them. Shared CPUs though are new and that will take a little bit of learning and understanding but they are a lot more flexible and they actually save money. In a dedicated CPU partition when we're not actually using the CPU what does the CPU actually do? Well it just wastes CPU cycles spinning in an idle loop. It's actually in a process called wait just to confuse you a little and if you use PS minus K you can actually see these wait processes normally they're hidden from you. In a shared CPU case, when we're not using the CPU, if we're not using all the time that we've been allocated, then the CPUs are yielded and given back to the pool, and those CPUs can go and help out another logical partition that does have work to do. For dedicated CPUs, when we use our CPUs 100%, that's it. There's nothing else you can do. Um, you're just uh, limited to how much performance you can get. In a shared CPU case, if we go uncapped, we'll look at that mode later on, then we can borrow CPU cycles from other logical partitions that are not using their quota, or if there are just freely available CPUs in the pool, not actually allocated to anybody, we can just grab those and then we can get over our perhaps performance peak while maintaining our response times. Now for dedicated CPUs, we can dynamically change those logical partitions. We can allocate an, an extra CPU or take a CPU away from a logical partition dynamically while it's actually running. And if you do that as a user, that will take you perhaps 30 seconds to log on and make the change and activate it. Or you could do that via a script. For shared CPUs, we have dynamic management as well. But here, it's all completely automatic. The hypervisor will automatically move from hundreds of a CPU from one logical partition to another one based on the actual demand happening right now. It's much more responsive to what is actually demanded by each logical partition. Also with shared CPUs, if they're unused CPUs, we can group them all together and we can work out over a week, a month or a quarter, say, we can work out that out of all our CPUs in our machines, we never actually use those last four CPUs, and we can harvest those to perhaps run more workloads on this particular machine, effectively without having to pay for those extra CPUs, because we've grouped them together, pulled them together, and then we can see the CPU cycles that we're not actually using. 
Now for the donating case, donating is much like a dedicated CPU partition, except in the case when we're not using the CPUs that have been allocated to us. And in this case, it then behaves like a shared CPU logical partition, and it can loan those CPUs to the shared CPU pool for another logical partition to actually go and use. The donating CPU logical partition has first call on the CPUs that it's loaned, if you like, to the other partition. So if it needs it, it gets those CPUs back in preference to other logical partitions. Otherwise, though, it's like a dedicated partition. Now here's a quick reminder then for the dedicated CPU logical partitions. This is actually the panel we use when we're creating a logical partition. You can see that we have a dedicated selected here. And we have three numbers that we can put in, the minimum processors, the desired, and the maximum. These are actually used in two different cases. When we actually start up our logical partition, it will attempt to get the desired number of processors that you set there. In this case, it's eight. Now, if it finds eight CPUs are available, it will start your dedicated partition with eight CPUs. But if it can't find all eight, perhaps it can only find seven or six CPUs. As long as it's above the minimum, it will still start your logical partition with lower numbers of CPUs. But if it can't get the minimum number of CPUs, it will just put up a warning saying, I can't get those number of CPUs, we're not going to start the logical partition. And then you can go around finding out uh, why those CPUs are in use and bring them back for this logical partition. That is used for a little bit of a, a safety net. Um, if you've got a big database, for example, there's no point in starting up with one CPU. You know as soon as the users get on, they'll all start complaining about the performance. So you can say, well, we need a minimum of four CPUs to actually get this thing working properly. And so we can use the desired minimum for that purposes. Now, when our logical partition is actually running, then we have a certain number of CPUs allocated to it, and we can dynamically change those. We go to the HMC, or the IVM, and we can tell it to change the number of CPUs for this logical partition. And again, the minimum and maximum numbers are used in this case. This m limits the range of numbers of CPUs we can allocate to this logical partition while it's running. We can't go below the minimum, and we can't go above the maximum. But it doesn't, these minimums and maximums don't affect it as it's running. We, whatever the number of CPUs allocated to the logical partition, that's the amount of compute resources it actually has. Now as a quick reminder, down the bottom here, this uh, button, allow when partition is active, this is processor sharing, this is how we switch on the donating feature for a dedicated logical partition. And the other button here is if we want to allow the sharing of our CPUs when it's inactive. When we stop a logical partition, we can earmark the CPUs that it uh, was using for its sole use, so nobody else can go and grab these particular CPUs. Now we've changed the processing mode from dedicated to shared. There's a few differences that we want to draw out here. First of all, for the processing units, we still have the minimum, desired, and maximum, and they're used much like dedicated CPUs. So the desired is what we want, the minimum is the, what we're willing to go down to if we want to start up, and then the minimum and maximum are used as bounds checks if we want to make a dynamic CPU change of a shared CPU partition. A couple of differences, though, is first of all, you'll note that we can use fractions of a CPU in here. With dedicated CPUs, they're whole CPUs. The next thing to note is that the desired, or what the partition actually gets allocated as CPU, is called entitlement. I don't know how this happened, where we changed the name here, but when we're running a shared CPU, we say how much CPU is it entitled to. And this means a guaranteed amount of CPU time. In this case, you can see if there's uh, enough CPU resources available in the pool, we'll get uh, a desired of 6.5 CPUs, that's our entitlement, and we're guaranteed to get 6.5 CPUs worth of time. Now in actual fact, the hypervisor decides which CPU we're actually going to be allocated, and over time it may actually move that around uh, for efficiency reasons to give us perhaps a bigger share of a particular CPU. One important thing to remember before we go to the next slide 
is that this minimum and maximum processing units does not affect what the partition actually gets. So a logical partition set up like this, 2.5 as a minimum, 6.5 and, and 12, when it's actually running it can drop down to practically zero, you know, a thousandth of a CPU time if it's actually idle, and it could go up to 16 CPUs. This machine has 16 CPUs. The minimum and maximums are only there as limitations if we actually want to change the entitlement. This is the guaranteed CPU time. These other items on the shared CPU setup we'll also look at the shared processor pool. There's two other movies, so have a look at those to understand that. We also have this concept of virtual processors, and this is where we get a lot of confusion. And we're going to cover that in some detail, and we'll also look at uncapped and capped. What does that mean? And the weight of a shared CPU logical partition. Now let's have a quick look at virtual processors, and we'll take as an example a logical partition that's entitled to two CPUs worth of time, and it's on an eight-way and eight CPU machine. It just makes the diagrams a little simpler. There are different ways of implementing that two CPUs worth of compute time. We could put them all onto two CPUs and they'd be used 100%, um, or we could split them, say, into across four CPUs and it gets half of each of those, or all eight CPUs in the machine and it gets 25% of those eight CPUs. And we have to give a hint to the computer which we'd actually like it to do. Now, these numbers in here are the virtual processors. And so this is the number we have to give it to decide how to actually implement that two CPUs worth of compute time. And if we'd call this number the spreading factor, how many CPUs do you want your logical partition to spread out over, it would make an awful lot more sense and a lot less uh, confusing. Now clearly if we want two CPUs worth of compute time, we've got to have at least two CPUs in here. And as we go up into higher numbers of CPUs, it's a swings and roundabouts in here. If we're just using two CPUs, then that's very highly efficient, isn't it? Uh, for example, the cache would only have to move between those two CPUs, and as we're on the CPU, we get a lot of work done. If we're only a little bit of time on eight CPUs, there's some uh, pros and cons in here, and we'll look at that on the next slide. So it is using all eight virtual processors a good idea? Well the answer is not all of the time. If we split our logical partition on eight CPUs and it's not doing very much, well the hypervisor has to schedule the logical partition onto each of those eight CPUs within a 10 millisecond window. And it's a bit like AOX putting a process onto the CPU. This is now the hypervisor putting the logical partition onto the CPU. There's a little bit of overhead to do with uh, scheduling the logical partition, putting it on the processor and, and letting it run. If there's not much to do, the AOX will run and it will say, well, I actually haven't got anything to do here. Um, it may wait a, a millionth of a second or so to see if an interrupt fires or locks and latches are freed up and it can do something. And if not, it then calls the hypervisor saying, well, that was a waste of time. Go and run some other logical partition, not me. And come back to me when I've got something to do. Also, if you're running eight CPUs in this configuration, then we're going to have to move data between the caches of these CPUs. An example here is if we had... Uh, and perhaps an Apache server sharing some data is running eight threads at the same time and some data item will have to be moved across between these CPUs and you say well if we actually pushed all this work down into one CPU it would sit in the data would sit in the cache and it'd be immediately available all the time if we could actually fit the workload into one CPU so that's exactly what it does if we imagine a logical partition that's just basically idle is just ticking over a few device drivers running every now and again, there'll be some clock interrupts happening 100 times a second. We could just run that logical partition down on onto one CPU, it will just tick over nicely, and the other seven CPUs can go off and run other logical partitions that perhaps have more to do at the moment. Then if our workload builds up and perhaps we need half a CPU worth of power, well one CPU is enough to run that, and it will do it nicely, efficiently on that uh, single CPU. If it builds up, say we get to point 
then the hypervisor says, well, look, this logical partition is getting busier. Um, perhaps it actually needs a second CPU. We're going into a peak here. So it will actually schedule the logical partition over two CPUs. Then perhaps it continues to build up. And then when it gets to a threshold, 80% um, on both of those, then it will say, okay, perhaps we now need to switch in the, the third processor and make use of that to make sure that when we hit the peak, we've got enough CPUs online and so forth. So it will actually build up. And when we actually really need seven CPUs or more, then it will actually allocate us all the eight CPUs. And it's doing this for efficiency reasons. There's no point in running lots of CPUs if we don't actually need them. Now, as well as the virtual processor number giving us control out of how many CPUs a logical partition can spread over, and it may not actually spread over that, the hypervisor could use less CPUs if it wants. We can also see the virtual processor number as a limiter. For example, here we have, might have an entitlement of two CPUs, but if we set the virtual processor to four, this logical partitioning can use up to four CPUs but it can't use the 5th or the 6th or the 7th or 8th CPU. It is limited now to 4 CPUs. It could go to 100% busy on those 4 CPUs, but that's it. It can't spread out further across the machine. Now, there are also two other limitations in the machine. First of all, we've got 8 CPUs, so there's no point in having a virtual processor number bigger than 8. It could never actually use those number of CPUs. Secondly, if we have a logical partition that has dedicated CPUs, then those CPUs are not in the pool. So our logical partition using a shared processor can only use the pool CPUs, and so we can only get up to a maximum of six CPUs in this particular case. Now, in addition to this, there are other limitations, and we can look at capped and uncapped in particular. If the logical partition is capped, this means it will get up to, in this case, two CPUs. It may actually be spread out across four CPUs, but then it is stopped. This logical partition will be taken off the processor if it's used as entitlement, and it will just have to wait. Even if there are unused CPUs in the machine, it will just wait until it comes back to its next time slice and get back onto the processors. If it is uncapped, in our example here, our logical partition can use up to four CPUs because that's the virtual processor count limit. Of course, its entitlement is guaranteed. Above its entitlement, it can only get CPU time if it's available. There may be CPUs in the pool that are not allocated at all, so they're always up for grabs for whichever logical partition would like more CPU time. Or it might be allocated to a logical partition, but it's not using it at the moment, and it's yielded the processor so some other logical partition, ours in this case, can actually make use of that CPU time. Now, if we increase the virtual processor number, then our logical partition here could now get up to all the CPUs in the pool. Of course, guaranteed its entitlement. The rest depends on what the other CPUs are actually doing. And if we switched off our dedicated CPU partitions, this logical partition, if the virtual processor number is high enough, can use all the CPUs in the actual machine. Now let's have a look at the weight factor. Here we have four logical partitions. They're allocated their entitlement. You can see there are different sizes here. And each logical partition is guaranteed to get its compute cycles within a 10 millisecond window for its entitlement. So let's say they all start off and they all start running. And then by the time we get to 60% of our way through our 10 millisecond window here, we find that each of the logical partitions has completed its entitlement, is guaranteed. We find logical partition 1 actually finished early. It didn't use all its entitlement and so yielded the processor and gave back the CPU cycles. So in the rest of the 40% here, we're going to allocate those spare CPU cycles to the three remaining logical partitions that still want to carry on running. If we look at the weight factors, two of them are at 100, and LPAR4 has a higher weight of 200. So we use that factor to work out how much CPU time each of these logical partitions get. So the first two will get 25% of what's left, and the larger weight factor will get the 50%, because it's twice as heavy. Now we'll carry on running again, and say we get to 70%, so 
these logical partitions have got these extra compute cycles in here but now we find logical partition 3 it said okay I'm done I've done everything I've stopped using the processor I can give it up to somebody else again we look at the weight factors now they're 100 and 200 and we'll split the remaining time between these two logical partitions based on that weight factor and off they go again now let's say that in this case these logical partitions continued all the way to the end of the 10 millisecond window. Now then we forget anything to do about weight factors. Each of our logical partitions is allowed to run again up to its entitlement. We carry on going through this loop again and again for each 10 millisecond window. So I hope you can see that based on the weight factors, the spare CPU cycles are given out to the various logical partitions that are uncapped and can use more CPU cycles. So let's summarize what we looked at in this movie. We've compared and contrasted the dedicated, donating and shared CPU. We then looked at the shared CPU logical partitions, particularly focused on the CPU entitlement. This is the guaranteed CPU time that the logical partition has. If it doesn't need all that time, it will yield the processor so somebody else can use the CPU time. We looked at the virtual processors. This is how we spread out our CPU time across our CPUs. The hypervisor will reduce the number of virtual processors it's actually using for efficiency reasons. We looked at capped, where we're limited to entitlement or uncapped where we can go and use spare CPU resources and we've looked at the weighting factor which is used to decide which logical partitions get the bulk of the spare CPU cycles. We've also looked at the minimum desired and maximum and the minimum and maximum are only used at startup time and when we want to change the entitlement or the virtual processor number. Those minimums and maximums are not used when we're actually running on the machine.